Hello and welcome to Ivory Blush Roses. My name is Lisa and I am so grateful you are here with me today. We're going to take a look at how I made a hand-stitched mug rug. I made a smaller mug mat many years ago and I really loved it. It was made with scraps of fabric and then hand-stitched with a Bora or Cantha style stitching. I used it a lot and it made me smile every time I used it. But then I let somebody talk me into buying it from me. I hope it brought her as much joy as it brought me. Eventually I made a new one, but it was pretty bright, and though the colors were similar, it never quite satisfied me in the same way. I've made some larger machine quilted mug rugs as well. None of them go very well in my revamped sewing corner. So today I'm making a new mug rug to go on my sewing table. For fabric, I'm using scraps of batik and linen fabric that I cut into one and a half inch squares. I'm using a method I learned from Jude Hill that she called faux paper piecing. There won't be any machine stitching on this at all. It's completely hand sewn. The finished size will be around seven by nine inches, providing space for both my mug and my water cup. By the time I started filming, I had already chosen my fabric squares and laid them out in a rough arrangement and stitched a few rows. To make the paper templates that I use, I cut squares from a piece of cardstock using a one inch square scrapbooking punch. The punch keeps everything consistent. If one piece wears out, I can grab a new one and know that it is exactly the same size as the last one. I like having a whole assortment of them because as you use it, the edges soften up and get kind of wavy and bent, making it harder to keep the squares the same size. When that happens, I discard the wavy template and get a new one out. This is one I've used quite a bit. You can see how the edges wear. The size change isn't appreciable most of the time, but the nice straight edges help get a nice firm crisp edge. I like to plan out the placement of each piece in advance. I start from the bottom and work my way up, one row at a time. With cats in the house, I've learned to assemble things right away so they don't accidentally get mixed up. I also try to take a photo of my layout once I'm satisfied with it, just in case. Mushu especially loves to come up on the sewing table with me while I'm working. Let's work on the next row. I start off by looking at the fabric square to see which side I want to show. Then I center the template in the center of the square. I finger press the top and bottom edges over. Then I rotate and press the remaining edges. I remove the template and then quickly repress the edges with my fingernails and set it aside. I repeat until the entire row is finger pressed. Linen is much coarser and doesn't hold a finger press very well, so I put two pins in those to help them hold the shape. By the time I'm ready to sew it on, the edges have adapted and are much easier to handle. I do the finger pressing with my fingernails. My fingernails are fairly firm and thick and that works very well most of the time but there are other tools you can use as well. Using these tools requires the edge to be pressed against a firm surface, whereas with fingernails, I don't need anything else. To stitch the squares together, I'm using two strands of embroidery floss. The whip stitches will show just a little bit, and I like that added texture and color that they add. I add a small knot to the end of my thread. Then, pinching the two squares together, I stitch them together with a whip stitch about one eighth of an inch apart or less. My needle always runs perpendicular to the squares, which help it look neater once the pieces are flattened out. At the end, I make a small knot, cut my thread. On the wrong side, the whip stitches look angled. And then ease the stitch pieces open, keeping the front square on top. It now becomes the back square. 
I've found it helpful to be consistent in how I stitch the squares together. The old or the rightmost square always goes in the back and the new square, which is the square to the left that I'm adding, is always in the front. That way I know which way the strip of squares is oriented once I'm finished and I don't get mixed up along the way. The last square always goes to the left and I repeat until I've stitched an entire row. You'll see that I also like to keep all the folds going in the same direction. Using a thimble when stitching these pieces together really helps in getting the needle through multiple layers of fabric and it allows me to sew faster. Having a good sharp smooth needle helps as well. If needed, I run it through an emery strawberry to clean and keep it smooth. Once I've completed two rows, it's time to stitch them together. To stitch the rows together, the bottom row is now the old or back row, so it goes on the bottom. The new row goes on the top with faces together. I match the ends and roughly line up the seams. I don't usually pin at the seams, but you could do so if you like. There is always a small variation in size between the squares due to the different fabrics used, but it's pretty easy to ease them in to match the corners as you go. And then I stitch the rows together, just like I did for the individual blocks. You'll note though that there are now four folds to stitch through instead of two because of the way the blocks are folded. Be careful to make sure you're catching the two inner folds, which are the block faces, as they are what is going to show. Keep stitching one row at a time and adding it on to the previous row as you go. I finished piecing the mat. You can see that it's a little wrinkly. On the back I managed to get all the rows nicely lined up, so that's looking pretty good. I put a pin in this linen piece because that coarser fabric wants to keep unfolding. Before I move to the next step, I want to give this a good pressing. I want to flatten out all those seams and it will stretch the whole piece out a little bit. If I didn't do that when I go to stitch, it will really pucker up and shrink. And while I like some texture, I don't want too much. I try and keep this as square as possible. The outer edges are bobbling just a little bit and I can repress them a little to help, but it's also something I can accommodate when we create the self-binding later on. I love the way that you can see the stitching between the squares. That's part of the appeal of doing the piecing this way for me. You could do it all by machine and it may take less time, but for me half the enjoyment is in seeing the handwork. This is the mug mat that I have currently on my sewing table. It's all holiday fabrics and it's one of the reasons I wanted to make a new one. I love having these bigger mats because I can set my water cup and my teacup on the same mat. This one is just machine quilted and then I put a separate binding on it. But when I'm doing one like today, I prefer to create a self binding with the backing fabric. I also want to add a center layer to give it some insulation because I am putting my hot mug of tea on it. 
This is a smaller mug mat that I made last year. It wasn't big enough, and to be truthful, I wasn't happy with the colors, as it came out a bit too bright for my tastes. But I love the way you can see the stitching on the back and the texture of it. You can see how the back wraps around to the front to make the self-binding. The next thing I need to do is choose the fabric that's going to go on the back of the mug mat. Whatever I use will really frame the piece. This fabric is going to wrap around and become the self-binding. So I'm going to see what fabrics I have that coordinate well with the stitched squares. At the moment, I'm thinking one of the blue fabrics would be nice. I'd love to do the linen, but I'm not sure I want to use a piece of expensive linen on the back of something that's just going to have my teacup sitting on it. Let me pull some fabrics and we'll take a look. Since I usually cut my squares out of scraps of fabric, a lot of times they are the last pieces that I have of that particular fabric, and that's what I'm finding here. Out of all these fabrics, I only have a few larger pieces of these left. So let's see what these would look like if they're acting as the binding. This one's alright. I don't mind it, but I'm not sold on it either. And then I have this fabric that's here in several places. That's actually not too bad. I rather like this one, so I think we'll keep this as a definite contender. I also have some of this fabric. There are several patches of that. That's a possibility as well, although I don't think I like it as well as this one. I also used one square of this kind of green. It's a coarsely woven cotton. For those of you who've been watching me for very long, you know that green is my favorite color, but it's not the color I want for this piece. Now this piece of fabric is not in any of the squares, but the colors go well. The piece I have is narrow, only 5 to 6 inches wide, so I would need to piece it together. Hmm. You know, I think it kind of dulls it out. I want to stay more in the blue tones, I think. I'm thinking this one is our winner. I like that one the best out of the bunch. Let me know in the comments below which background you would have chosen. Well, after thinking about it for a bit, I want to try a piece of linen after all. This one is not identical to the one that I used, but I think it will give us an idea of how it would look. Oh, I do like that. Which do you like best, the blue or the linen? I'm going to see if I can find a large enough piece of the linen that I used in the blocks. It turns out that I actually had quite a bit of this linen left. There are two smaller pieces and a bit of yardage left. One of the small pieces is a square that might be large enough. My only concern is that it might mean a pretty narrow border. Here's a bigger piece. Let's try this one. Yes, this will be much better, and that way I can just stitch and I don't have to worry about it being too small. I'm so much happier with this linen than anything else I've tried. I also have this heavier weight flannel that I'm going to use as the middle layer. It's my favorite thing for interlining crazy quilts. It's easy to stitch through and it gives a nice feel. I cut it about an inch larger than the squares. To press the linen, I give it a little spritz with some distilled water and let it sit for a few minutes. Even with just that bit of dampness, you can see the wrinkles coming out already. A quick press and it's ready to square up. I'm allowing lots of extra room around the edge on this one. I'm going to press this one too. Once the layers are stacked up, I pin the layers together, especially at the corners. In hindsight, I probably should have basted these layers together. Next, I need to decide what color thread to use for the stitching. I decided to use the same thread as before but instead of two strands, I'm going to use three. With my thread chosen, I need to decide what type of stitching I'm going to do. I like stitching on the diagonal, as well as what I call a field pattern. I suppose it's really a basket weave, but to me it looks like fields of crops. I'm going to work on one block of four squares at a time, starting near the center and working my way out. I'm going to stitch a field pattern and alternate it with the diagonal stitching on the next set of blocks, eventually filling in the two patterns across the whole piece like a checkerboard. Now I'm ready to start stitching. Stitching like this uses quite a bit of thread, so I'm glad I have extra. One of the reasons that I didn't want to baste everything down is that I want to be able to access the center to hide my knots inside. I'm starting with diagonal rows of running stitch and stitching them about an eighth of an inch apart. In the corners where there are lots of folds, I use a stab stitching method to make sure I get through all those layers. I'm continuously rotating my piece as I work. The stitching gives a little bit of pucker in the fabric, 
I like the look of it as well as the texture it gives. But if it gets too puckered, I simply stretch the fabric out a bit to relax the thread. I don't try and line the stitching up, I just stitch across it as it goes. I also don't worry too much if my rows aren't perfectly straight. It goes pretty quickly. When my thread gets too short, rather than tying a knot, I'll bury the end with little back stitches. If my thread is long enough, I'll actually go back to the inside and do a knot on the inside. Now let's do that basket weave pattern on the next set of blocks. To make it easier, I'm going to mark this four square with a grid, marking each small square in thirds with an air erasable pen. I don't always do this, but this is going to help me keep my pattern a little more even. By the time I'm done stitching, all these lines will have disappeared. The first block is going to go vertical, and the second block is going to go horizontal, and will alternate all across the row, and then coming back, it's on the next row, it's going to be opposite to that, and that's what gives it the basket weave pattern. So this pattern uses three straight stitches in a row in each small square that I've marked, and then the next one turns and goes the other way. I want to stitch this consistently so the pattern on the back is also consistent. Check the back of your work, and if something doesn't feel right, make sure that you check it. You could minimize thread use if you wanted to, but I really love having the pattern on the back, so I don't like to do that. To me, that's just part of the story of the whole piece. The stitch is definitely more noticeable on the surface than the other one. The other one's more subtle, and I really love the combination of stitches. Make sure you're not pulling too tight because you can really scrunch this up. And I don't know if you can see, but where I've stitched, you can already tell that it's pulled in a little bit compared to the rest of it. If you pull too tightly, it's going to distort your piece. Sometimes you want that effect, but on something like this, I really want to maintain the shape. This feels pretty soft and loose, but once you get stitching on it, it becomes much more substantial. I finished all the boro stitching on my mug mat. As you can see, it did get distorted a little bit. I think basting it would have helped the rows of blocks stay a little straighter. Well, hello, Mooshu. He likes to be in the middle of whatever is going on. He hears me talking, and he thinks I'm talking to him. Before going any further, I want to give this a pressing and get the edges as straight as possible. I'm going to start by pressing it from the back side. This edge is a little bobbled. I can straighten out this bottom edge pretty well. In all, it's really not too bad, and if I had basted this together before doing the stitching, I don't think it would have done it nearly so much, especially along those inner seams. Even with a little bit of pressing, it really maintains its texture. Let's see what the border will look like if I roll the edge over. This is too wide. I want an edge that's about 3 eighths of an inch wide rather than half an inch. Using this blue water removable marker, I'm going to mark where I want to trim both the interlining and the backing. On this first edge, I got distracted and cut it too short. It barely allows a quarter inch border. I'm going to allow extra room on the other edges. That's the way it is sometimes. So you wing it and it makes for a change and you know what? That's okay. 
Maybe I can maximize the edge and do more of a rolled hem on that particular piece to get the widest possible edge. I'm going to go ahead and mark the other edges, but I'm going to make sure that I leave more leeway. I'm not worried about the blue marks and the iron because all of that's going to be covered up and none of it will be visible. This is more the size that I was hoping for. I'm going to do this one side at a time. The flannel forms my foundation and it's what will keep everything really nice and even. You can see just how nicely that evens it all out. It ends up looking pretty decent. I can approach the corners in two different ways. To do squared corners, I would cut away some of this excess before I fold it over and then over again. Then I work my way around and do each corner exactly the same. This pocket prayer shows what those types of corners end up looking like when it's finished. I much prefer a mitered corner. Here's my way of doing it. I know that my corner is here that I need to match to. You can see why I like to have pressed my corners all the way out. I'm going to trim this one off, reducing my bulk just a little bit in those corners. But I need just a little bit more to fold over. I'm going to fold it on that point so fold over and over again. You should get a nice miter corner. I'm going to get my pins to hold everything in place. I want it to meet right here where I want it to match so I can adjust that corner. I'll stitch out to the end of each corner and that's actually going to bring the edges together to make a nice sharp corner. I'm going to pin the sides here and do the same here. Now we're working with that one edge where I cut it too shallow. I need to be really careful here. I don't want to lose any of that fabric. It's almost a rolled edge rather than folded. It's so tiny. I was in too much of a hurry, but it's salvageable. And that's the thing with stuff. You don't have to toss it in the bin just because it didn't work exactly the way you wanted the first time. And it's going to have a little variation. That's what they would call wabi-sabi. It is what it is. At least that's how I interpret it. You use what you have and you make it work even if it's not perfect and the imperfections are what make it unique. Now the mat is all pinned. The wobbliness that we could see earlier is almost gone and I can adjust it as we go. I'm going to redo these pins sideways so that it's a little easier to stitch with them in. Now I'm going to whip stitch this edge. I thought about doing the whip stitching with a matching sewing thread, but then I thought about using the same variegated embroidery thread I've been using. Let's take a quick look at the back side. If I do the whip stitching with the embroidery thread and bring it all the way through the back, it will create a nice little border. I'm using two threads again rather than three because I don't really want it to show too much from the top. I really only want it to show on the bottom. I'm going to run my knot inside the binding here so it won't show on the outside. And I'm going to whip stitch this way. And to make it show on the back, I'm doing it in a stab stitch manner. On the back, it shows like a little running or a back stitch. Now I'm at the corner, and before I stitch this seam, I don't know if you can see this, but this corner is a little further back from the other one. So I'm going to adjust it ever so slightly and see if we can change that. I'm securing that corner down because I want them to match perfectly. Now I'm going to whip stitch along these two corner edges. 
I don't want it to show in the back or on the front, so I'm going to whip stitch, barely catching the edge threads, and then pull it together nice and neat, hiding the stitches. I'm pretty happy with the way that turned out. The stitching is not super visible. So now I'm going to come back down that seam, taking a couple of discrete back stitches to secure the corner and get back to the main seam that I need to whip stitch. Now we're going to go back and do our nice little whip stitch along this side. On the back, it ends up looking like a little running stitch or even a little bit like a back stitch. It gives a nice border all the way around. My stitches are about an eighth of an inch apart. Now the whip stitching is completely done. I ended up using about one and a half skeins of the variegated thread to do all the piecing, boro, and whip stitching. Let's look at the back. Oh, I really love how the whip stitching frames this out so beautifully. That turned out great. I'm so glad I didn't use the regular sewing thread. It ended up being the perfect finish on the back for this piece. I'm really happy with how it turned out. We're nearly finished. I'm going to do a decorative feather stitch border all the way around the edge of the binding on top. I've pulled out two threads that I think might work, so let's take a look at them. This one is a vintage skein of pearl cotton, and I like the way it picks up the linen color. But I also have this spool of Valdani pearl cotton in a size 12. I think it's the one I'm going to use because I like the variegated color that goes with the linen. It adds interest without being overpowering or detracting from the boro stitching. I'm using a standard feather stitch, maybe 3 16ths of an inch in length. It's nice to have the contrast from the other stitching for a change. I'm right-handed and I find that for me, this stitch works really easily from side to side, and I work from right to left. I'm working just on the upper layers of fabric. I'm not going through to the back side on this particular instance because I don't want to interfere with the stitching on the back. So I have my top layer, the flannel, and then the bottom layer, and the needle never pierces that bottom layer. I think this has been the fastest stitching of the whole project. It's nice to finish a project with the fastest part right at the end. I'm going to do one last thing with this mug mat, and that's because I've come to believe very strongly that we need to take credit for the work that we do. While I often embroider my name on, I forgot to do that, so I'm going to use this custom name tape that I ordered many, many years ago. All I'm going to do is take two or three tacking stitches in each end. And now we're done. Here's the finished mug mat. I like the look of this new one so much better. I'm so happy to have a mat that will protect my sewing table and give me a dedicated place to put my mug or water cup and that the colors go so well in my stitching corner. I hope you've enjoyed watching this come together. I'm so grateful that you've been here with me today. Let me know if you have any questions in the comment section below. Have a beautiful day and I'll see you in the next video.